former Donald Trump advisor, Omarosa Manigault Newman. She was a contestant on the first season of The Apprentice. She's also the author of Unhinged, an insider's account of the Trump White House. Omarosa, thanks for joining us tonight. You've seen the thanks headlines. Thanks for having me, Abby. 30 underwriters have said no to Donald Trump when he went to them and asked for help to cover this half a billion dollar bond. The, for decades, banks have been willing to lend to Trump for all kinds of reasons, during all kinds of financial distress. Why not now? Well, it's very simple, Abby. They don't trust him, and they don't believe that he'll pay them back. Uh, the other part of it is that Donald Trump has, for so many years, run a scheme, and he's built his business on deceit and a house of cards. And as we can see, that house of cards is now going to collapse. So one of Trump's attorneys, Alina Haba, she promised over and over again that Trump would be able to cover everything, even as recently as last month. Listen. Does Donald Trump so. have that kind yeah. of money sitting around? Yes. I mean, he does. Of course he has money. You know, he's a billionaire. Um, we know that. This guy is worth a lot of money, billions and billions of billions of dollars. He happens to have a lot of cash. Of course he has the money. Why would she lie like that so boldly and seemingly without any sort of, you know, self-awareness? Well, the truth of the matter is, if Donald Trump had the money, he would not be asking for special favors from the judge. He wouldn't be asking that that $464 million be reduced to $100 million. He's asked to be treated differently than others who would be in this situation. If it, you or I, we couldn't go to the courts and say, look, we don't have the money for our appeal. Can you make some exceptions for us? But Donald Trump is expecting special treatment special favors because he believes that he is above the law. But in this case, he's going to have to pay or he just will have his property seized. And that is his worst nightmare, Abby. Yeah. And it's also something that will follow him. I mean, he's going into this election. A lot of his supporters, maybe other people too, believe this myth, essentially, that he's fantastically wealthy, that he's an outsider. Does this puncture that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, from the first day of The Apprentice, the, the story that was told to the audience was that Donald Trump was so extraordinarily wealthy. And what we've learned from the producers is that this was an image that they actually helped to build, that they helped to promote. And so we know that he kind of built this persona. He's been kind of marketing and using it. But then he turns around and asks, average Americans to send him money to help him with his legal fees, to help him fight the Joe Biden hoax, as he called it, or his spokesman called it. The truth of the matter is that now the curtain is going to be pulled back and his supporters are going to see that what Donald Trump says about his wealth and about the money that he has, he simply does not have it. The former president, he has long demonized the prosecutors who go after him. Does it bother him, you think, that this is coming from Letitia James, a woman and a black woman, um, that she's really been kind of laser focused on making sure that this case goes through and that, you know, she's been pretty clear. She'll take the, the, the buildings if she has to. Well, anytime that D Donald is being held accountable for his bad behavior, he is going to be unhappy, but he is particularly angry about the fact that he is being held accountable, not just by a woman, but by an African-American woman. In this case, in Georgia, you know, the case that he has against him in New York, I mean, all of these cases are by African-Americans who were strong enough, bold enough, and who were willing to put themselves out there to bring Trump to justice. This is really probably taking him up. And I think one of the things I want to point out to you is that Donald Trump is also very strategic about what he does. He knew over the weekend, probably as far back as last week, that he could not get a surety company to extend his bond. And so what does he do? He creates a distraction by using, you know, insightful words, bloodbath, calling immigrants animals. He knew what he was going to do. 
and he knew that it would drive the news cycle. He wanted to distract from the fact that he was rejected not just once, not five times, not 10 times, but by 30 different companies who are not willing to do business with Donald Trump. And that sends a strong message to the people who are expecting him to be able to uh, you know, be responsible for the money and running this country and being fiscally responsible. He's just not able to do that. Well, one of the things about court documents is that you can't really hide them in, in cases like this. So the news will yeah. come out eventually. Omarosa Manigold Newman, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me, Abby. And also tonight, Peter Navarro is suddenly sharing a whole lot in common with the movie from the last decade. I'm looking to join the Crenshaw Kings. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he just wants you to protect him while he's on the inside. Teach me how to survive in prison the way you did. Wait, what? I could pay you. See you tomorrow, convict. If you haven't seen it, that's from the film Get Hard, where a white-collar criminal goes to prison and hires a consultant to help prepare him to do time. It is the exact same position that Navarro is in right now. After the Supreme Court said no to his emergency appeal, he was convicted, remember, of contempt of Congress. Navarro, like in the movie, he has hired a prison consultant of his own. And despite the minimum security setting that he is likely to go into, that consultant has told CNN tonight that the tough-talking MAGA acolyte is actually nervous. But look online and you'll see Navarro playing martyr. Men and women of, of, of America throughout our history have shed blood, lost their lives for the defense of this country, defense of what we stand for, defense of our values, defense of the Constitution. And for me, it's, 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 a, it's a much smaller sacrifice to be willing to go to prison, as I now have been ordered to do, to defend what is really one of the most important principles of, of the Constitution. Joining me now is Eric Singleton. He's a federal prison consultant. In 2022, he pleaded guilty to embezzlement and served eight months of a one-year and a day sentence. Uh, Eric, based on your experience, should Navarro oh, yeah. be nervous? He should. And I think anyone going into this situation should be nervous, primarily not for the fear of violence, as uh, the movie Get Hard implies, but mostly for the lack of control. Uh, Mr. Navarro's lived a life where he's been able to control many things about his life. And once someone checks into a prison camp, things change dramatically. Uh, small things like getting a pillow for your bed may be impossible or it may take months. Uh, things such as making sure you're getting the adequate prescriptions that uh, you uh, have been taking on the outside involve a very lengthy administrative process involving numerous cells. So even though the, the physical danger is not the risk for him, it is a, a whole new world of lacking control of everyday, very simple activities. What about the culture inside of these prisons? I mean, this is basically a white collar prison, so it's not it's not some kind of maximum security facility, but what is he going to have to adjust to to fit in? Right. That is another shock for a lot of white collar criminals uh, going in. Many of them assume they're going to be surrounded by a lot of other white collar criminals because camps are known for being a place for nonviolent offenders. But a typical white collar criminal that makes up about maybe one fourth of the population in a camp. The vast majority of people there are on nonviolent drug offenses, mm. and a lot of them are young. And so there can be a culture that's loud, it's boisterous, uh, a lot of craziness going on, and it, it can be very difficult for older inmates to adjust to that. Uh, they, uh, the particular prison where Mr. Navarro's going has a special wing 
for older inmates, but even that could be difficult to get into just because of the overcrowding that exists. So you've spent some time in a federal prison, um, longer than Navarro is likely to. How long did it take you to get used to it? And do you think that he will even have that kind of time? I think there are stages for every person. Uh, it, I, it's very common for people to think they've adjusted after their first weekend, and then something happens and pulls them out of their rhythm, and then they have a hard time adjusting from that. And, you know, I talked to people who had been in for seven years and still had those moments of just crashing down. Uh, simple things like getting your points added up correctly to try and get to an early release when that gets pulled away from someone for no reason. Uh, the very nature of the federal prison experience, I think makes it so people don't really get used to being there ever, uh, especially for the type of time that uh, Mr. Navarro is going to be there. I don't think he'll adjust at all.